Good evening once again, everyone. All right. Prayer and healing. We live in a time and in a society where there's a truth of, there's a provider of the truth. That provider of the truth is science. Uh, that started in about 1860 or so, and they still hold the truth. So if you want to know something, basically that's what our society goes by. We ask them. If they say, yeah, it's okay, then it's okay. If they say, no, it's not okay, it's not okay. And that science has been feeling a lot of pressure from different areas because what they're finding is not what they want to support anymore. So things like quantum physics will come around at times and find things that are not really what they wanted to say, but they have to because it's, those are new discoveries. And within this framework, there's always the question about how much does praying help in the healing process? And theoretically, uh, for science, there's no influence whatsoever. There's nothing to do one with the other. But that's changing. That's changing. It's changing really fast. Uh, if we look at this magazine here, which is a of course, everybody knows Time Magazine. It's one of the most important magazines in the world, not only here in the U.S., but it's, it's a global, international publication. What goes on this magazine matters a lot to a lot of people across the globe. Uh, when you get something in the cover of Time, that's even more important than what it, the magazine it is in theory. So if we look at this here, the top uh, article is how your mind can heal your body. Now you see, here's, here's the first thing we need to notice. It's not a question, it's an affirmation. Typically that would be a question, you know, like a, how your mind can, f you know, heal your body. And it's like, I don't really believe that. That's what it would entitle if there was a question. It's not a question, it's an affirmation. It's on the first page of the magazine. And when we look at the time of publication, this is 2003. It's not last year, it's not this year. So this is pretty old, if you think about it. It's more than 10 years ago, science or the, uh, this magazine was affirming that there's a connection. So we want to understand this connection. We want to see how we fit, how we spiritists fit in this thing and, and how it works. And how can I make, now that I know how it works, can I make better use of praying to heal somebody myself included. That's the, the idea for tonight. Now, the same science that for years and years and years has been telling us that there's no connection between mind and body, mind doesn't control the body, and anything along those lines, that same science tells us about the placebo effect. What is the placebo effect? Is it, 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 it's a situation where, let's just take a, an extreme case, for example, you're about to die. You're literally about to die uh, in a hospital and there's nothing else that you know medicine can do for you, nothing else that the doctors can do for you. And the doctor will come to you and say, well, you know, you're, you're leaving us, that's it. There's no, nothing more that we can do. Now, uh, for your particular case, you might be lucky because there's a, this pill that came out very recently. It just came out. It has not even been tested on people, it has been tested only in animals, and apparently that's it, that's the pill. Do you wanna try yes or no? The person is in that situation though, so most likely they'll say, yeah, I wanna try that. And then what, what they get is a sugar pill, and they get cured. You know, the disease just goes away. So that same science tells us there's no mind control in the body. But what is the placebo effect that they tell us? It is mind control in the body. So it's contradictory. It's very hard for science to establish a fine line. I believe this and I believe that. Or I believe this and I don't believe that. It's very difficult for them. And we understand it is difficult. We're not saying it's not. But because of their paradigm and the way they see things, it's very challenging. There's another situation in which you have people, again, about to die, a patient sit, uh, uh, laying down on a hospital bed, he's about to die, and family members and relatives and, you know, close friends will come around, ask permission, of course, to get into the room where the patient is, and they'll just come around the, the bed, you know, hand in hand like this, like you see here, 
and they say prayers. They might not belong to the same belief system, so it's not about belief system, it's about establishing a connection with your, the source of your belief system, let's just put it this way. And you know, we, they do that and for a great, in, in a number of cases, the patient gets out of the hospital, goes back to work and that's it. And science cannot really explain that. But we, we do have the explanation for that. That's what we want to study here today. What is the explanation? And now that I know what it is, how do I make better use of, use of this for myself? So here's the first question, healing. What does it mean? Because when I say healing, it has two meanings. Healing for us here in this center means one thing. For the doctor in the hospital means another thing. So we have the same word meaning two different things and it gets complicated because a dialogue between us and a doctor is not going to flow smoothly if we don't see the difference, if we don't know who is talking who. For the medical profession, what they do is they, uh, they are working at the material level. So what they do is they, they use drugs, administration of medicine and drugs. That's how they try to heal. That's how they address uh, health problems. On this side here, us, spiritualists and spiritists, we are part of them. We don't do that. We don't take drugs. We don't work at the physical plane. Our work, our, our focus is on the energy, the whole energy, that we see the body as a whole thing, not as a, a physical only. It's a combination of things. So this is the first thing. We here, on this right side here, we would never tell a patient that comes in for treatment, well, why don't you take two Tylenols? Because that's not on our scope, it's on theirs, okay? On their side, uh, medicine believes in surgery when things are not going well. So things are not going well, you start taking uh, pills or medicine or drugs, whatever it is, it's still not going well, and then you go for an extreme case of transplant, for example, or surgery, something like this. In here, there's no physical innovation. We're not gonna cut anybody's body or heart or anything like that. It's a different approach. For them, they use something that their, their work is based on something that we call reductionist model. Well, what this is, is the, idea, is the idea that things and the body are composed of pieces and parts. Imagine a car, for example, okay, you have a car you try to start the car, you won't start. You won't do anything. So you call the mechanic, he comes in, and he's gonna start eliminating. Well, it can't be the window, it can't be, you know, the, the, the seat, it can't be a lot of it can't be a lot of things, it can't be the brake. So he will streamline kind of dividing the car in several parts and pieces until he gets to the problem. Oh, this this is it. The wire is loose. So he gets it. That's the approach that we call reduction, is to reduce the car to pieces, small pieces, until you get to the problem. And that comes from Newton, from the days of Newton. Newton's, uh, in, in the 1700s, 1740, his question was, how does the universe work? That was the only thing he wanted to know. Now, think about this question for a minute. If I come here and I ask you, how does the universe work? I'm gonna get an answer more or less along these lines. Well, there's a primary intelligence, which is God, and there's a spiritual principle, material principle, something al along those lines. If I go to the astrophysics department of the university, I'm not gonna get anything like that. I'm gonna get, well, you have the planets, they interfere with each other, and so and so and so. There is no right and wrong. It's different views of the same thing. When Newton is asking himself, how does the universe work? He's asking from the physical point of view. So there is no God, there is no religion, there is no soul, nothing like this in his, under his terms. So anything that carries over that thought from Newton's days works in, uh, based on reductionism and it works on parts and pieces, including medicine. Conventional medicine follows Newton. Conventional medicine is like this, uh, I have a problem with my liver. Well, I'm gonna give you this medicine. Well, but this is gonna affect the heart, I don't care. It's gonna cure your liver, and you get onto that drug, and suddenly you have a heart problem. Then you go to the cardiologist, and you tell him, I have this problem now, and he's gonna say, oh, here's this medicine. Well, it's gonna affect my pancreas. I don't care, it's your heart. You see, it, it, they're looking at the parts and pieces. And there's a point where things are not fixable anymore. For example, the liver is not fixable anymore. You just 
take it out, put another one. It's called transplant. That's the, the approach to parts and pieces. So anything based on Newton takes that approach. On this side here, there's nothing like that. We don't follow uh, Newton. We follow quantum physics, which is totally different. Quantum physics, by the way, quantum physics discovers a new thing almost every week. It's just unbelievable the speed this is going. We started to understand a lot of things because of quantum physics. We do have MRI because of that. Newton would never be able to give us an MRI machine, PET scans, uh, cerebral scanners. We would never get anything like that if it wasn't for quantum physics. And quantum physics looks at a whole model. It's not a body where the liver doesn't have anything to do with the heart. No, they are strictly connected. Everything is connected. So if I touch here, it's going to touch there. If I touch here, it's going to touch here. That's the model that we follow. So it, it, you can see it's a completely different view of things. We're not saying one is right, the other is wrong. It, there are different views. The me, uh, medical profession treats the body, just the body. doesn't matter who you are as a person, if you're good or bad, if you've got good morals, bad morals, it just doesn't matter. It, they treat the body. On this side, we treat the soul. So the body doesn't matter. Moral matters. Behavior matters. It's, just, it's a completely different approach. So on this side here, medicine is never going to cure anything. It's never going to heal anything. The best they can do is give us relief. That's the best they can do. On this side here, yes, we can expect healing. Because this is where the source is. This comes from the soul. That comes from, that's a, a, a result of this expressed on the body. So if I'm suffering something, oh, it's really hurting here. I can get you medicine so it can go by without the pain. But it, that doesn't mean that the problem is going away. It isn't until we fix on this side. So healing has to do with the soul. So when we associate prayer and healing, we're talking about this side. So don't pray for your headache to go away because it doesn't apply. I want my headache to go away. You're on that side. Right? That doesn't apply. Now, I want to pray because, you know, I've been feeling this, and it's progressively getting worse, and I'm, I see my uh, disease, my body degenerating. Yes, so this is on this side. Okay, that has to be very clear for us. In order to uh, minimize these differences and harmonize what they mean, most universities now have this, medicine and spirituality. It is a requirement in most, most uh, faculties of medicine, it is a required course. And the goal is to make those people understand this side. So they don't go out there and just fill up prescriptions. That's the idea of medicine and spirituality. Of course, for this to be, uh, let's say, very popular in our clinics out there, it's going to take time. But it's a start. We have started already. This has been around for at least nine years in most universities in the U.S., okay? So it, it's a good thing. Okay. Now, how, so, so healing is where I want to focus, meaning it comes from the soul. So we need to understand how the thing goes from the soul into the body, and the body feels it and displays somehow. Well, here's the higher level. That's my thought. That's my mind. That's who I am as a spirit. Okay, I have my good thoughts, my bad thoughts. Depends on my level of evolution. Okay, those are more advanced, they have better thoughts all the time. The ones who are less advanced, or, you know, they have worse thoughts, per se, or lower energy all the time. And that's the first factor that differentiates. Because if we are on the level of evolution that's not so high, and most of us are right, right in, this, in this area here, we are going to provoke, we are going to make it happen, moral diseases. And they express themselves in different ways. I put three here. Uh, selfishness, hatred, and revenge. So these are moral diseases. And these diseases attach to the body. And they're going to generate what we call physical disease or degenerative, degenerative diseases. For example, cancer, diabetes, arthritis, and some others. Okay. So these things down here are consequences of moral diseases, which are consequences of 
my thoughts not being the high, at the highest level were not so great. Now, if the thing was just this, it would be kind of easy to understand, still hard to, you know, get rid of the situation, but that's not what it is. We send stuff back. We send feedback from the physical disease level to the moral level. Here's an example. I go to my doctor, and my doctor says, well, he got cancer. And the first thing that I do is, I want to kill everybody. I don't deserve this. You deserve this, not me. You see, I'm, instead of trying to understand that this came from moral disease and I have to lower the amount of moral disease that I'm putting out, I increase it by aggravating, by saying, I hate everybody, I want to kill everybody. What are you doing? You're, feed, you're sending feedback. You're making this higher, uh, greater than what it is. And same from the level of moral disease to the thoughts. We send feedback. So, for example, now I was diagnosed with, let's say, cancer, and I'm really frustrated, and my hatred level goes all the way up. When it goes all the way up, what happens to my evolution level? It stops. It stops. Then I stop. Then. I am the one creating all this situation. So the first thing I need to do to heal is to break those two feedbacks. I need to cut those feedbacks. I need to stop, you know, sending stuff back up. In order for me to break this green feedback here, I need to know. That's knowledge. That's why we come here. That's us. That's why we read an entire set of literature, uh, books in the l spiritist literature. That's where Emmanuel is. That's where Andrew Louise is. They're going to explain to us how to, uh, why we need to stop that. In, in details, Andrew Louise goes to the cell level, to the physical body level. Now, I also have to stop that. And how do I stop you know, my evolution by uh, increasing my level of revenge, uh, hatred, selfishness? By doing prayer. That's the only way to stop that. So healing is not easy because it's now a combination of two things. It's a combination of knowledge and prayer. So prayer by itself without knowledge doesn't do any good because I can tell you 10 prayers right now that I know since I was a kid. I can close my eyes and just tell you. It's not doing any good because there's no knowledge attached. I did not understand why I'm praying. I did not understand why I'm repeating the same words. So it's a combination of things. Healing must have, each one of them, must have knowledge and it must have prayer itself. Okay, now let's analyze a few things that we are told by uh, spirits. Here's uh, from Andre Luis. This is what it says. Seen from afar, human beings in the physical realm may be compared to travelers in a jungle of heterogeneous thoughts meaning there are thoughts of all kinds here and we are in the middle of it you are thinking each one of you is thinking a different thing and all the spirits here they're all thinking a different thing and we are in the middle of this it's a jungle by means of rigorous exercises to find their own way to freedom and excesses meaning i have to put the effort myself to not be sub susceptible to all these influences that's me nobody does that for me that's personal I need, if I go to, let's say, I need to go to a place that I don't want to be. Let's say that I need to go to a, a restaurant that I don't want to go, and the psychosphere, the, the psychic atmosphere is very bad. I am the one who need to work on that. Nobody's in the restaurant is going to say, oh, you're not feeling bad, let's make, you're not feeling good, let me make you better. Nobody's going to do that. Uh, we do this ourselves. It's our responsibility. They are mentally exposed, they meaning us, right? They're mentally exposed to all sorts of psychic influences, so it is crucial that they educate themselves to control their impulses, growing morally and intellectually to improve their thought projection. Meaning, if I don't know how to do this, and the only way to do this is becoming more morally and intellectually advanced, if I don't know how to do this, I'm going to be subject to all these influences, and I'm going to project these as being my thoughts. They're not, but they seem to be. So I need to stop that. That's one of the things he says. And he goes a lot further. Here's something else he says. 
concerning the health and maintenance of the physical body, and so now we're at the body level, and the acquisition of knowledge, human beings can draw upon the advice of doctors, nutritionists, teachers, and various guides. Right, when we get sick, what do we do? We go to a doctor. We seek advice at the medical level, at the material level. Yeah, their advice is good. We take that advice. Therefore, it is also natural for them to make use of prayer to gather the inspiration that they, they need to attune themselves to higher directives. So he's telling us two things. Yes, go to the doctor, seek advice. That's one thing. Now, you also have to do something else because here you're working at the physical level. Now, you also need to work at the soul level, at this level. And there's another thing here that's kind of embedded in the phrase, which is this. Imagine uh, 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 some doctor, he's, he's getting ready for surgery, let's say. So the patient is right here, and I'm the doctor. I come in, and of course, there's nurses and everything. Let's say it's a, it's a team of, let's say, 10 people, okay, working on that surgery. And here I am. I'm, I'm the surgeon. You see, what is wrong if I just minutes before I start, I get... I gather with my team, hands, any hand, and just tell everybody, just do a prayer within your belief system. Within your belief. Just ask for guidance. Just ask for good things to happen. That can make a difference. You see, that's the doctors could be doing this in our surgery rooms and in our hospitals, but they don't do it because there are issues with belief systems, and people can sue people because of that. That's a whole different level. That's a whole different animal. But we could do this, and it does help. It does help. We're going to see why it helps, why praying helps. It's going to be demonstrated. But that's another thing. There's nothing wrong of, about doing this. That doesn't make the doctor less of a doctor. It's not humiliation doing this. Why don't we do it? It's something so powerful. It's more powerful than just a doctor doing or just a nurse doing because it's collective. Collective prayer is even more uh, effective than regular prayer, than uh, one-person prayer. Now, continue with the, the paragraph, the ideas from Andrea Luis. This is something that usually we read and we just go by and we can do like this. This is probably one of the most important paragraphs in that book, The Mechanics of Mediumship. I'm just going to read the first phrase. We've got a comment on it. In the energy circuit established by prayer, we're going to stop there. What is a circuit? Electrical circuit, electronic circuit. For example, if I put my two fingers in here in the outlet, okay, I'm going to get some, something's going to happen. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, I, I ask you, take the fingers out. I took the fingers out. Then I ask you, is there electricity here? on that outlet? The answer is no. There is no electricity until the circuit is formed, is assembled. There is no electricity on that top outlet right now because there's nothing on it. The minute I put my fingers on it, oh yeah, then there's electricity. In the energy circuit, which is when I put my fingers and I close the circuit, I create the circuit when I put my fingers. In the energy circuit established by prayer, that means prayer creates this connection. If I don't pray, the outlet is just wide open like that. When I start praying, I create a circuit between me and the divinity. That's when I put my fingers in the outlet. So when I start my prayer, I'm putting my fingers in the outlet. Now the circuit is closed. Now, when the circuit is closed, right, the soul not only predisposes itself to regenerate the equilibrium of corrupted cells, physical cells. So when I put my finger on it, I'm saying to this divinity, I'm ready to, for you to work on my cells. That's what I'm doing. But if I take my fingers out, I shut down the circuit. I close the connection. Okay, so that could be done. Corrupted physical cells through the influx of the renewing energies it spontaneously incorporates, meaning when I close the circuit, I receive energy that is appropriate to heal my worn out physical cells. Now, let's make it very clear. Who closes the circuit? 
You see, it's, is it my finger going to the outlet where I'm just here and the outlet comes to me? It's me going to the outlet. So who closes the circuit? It's not God. It's me. It's when I want. And when I don't want, I don't want. You see, God or divinity or whoever you pray for, that entity, let's just put it this way, is not going to start anything. I start. And I have to be able to sustain. Can you imagine if I go here and I go like this all the time? Right. I'm not doing a, a, a circuit. This is just a, you know, on and off, on and off. This is totally fragmented. I have to put my fingers and stay and sustain. So I have to initiate this prayer and stay on it. Otherwise, I'm not creating any circuit. There are no forces being traded. Okay. All right, and then assimilating rays from the highest life. Assimilating rays from the highest life. It comes from top. But also, you see, so this is, not only it's going to renew the physical cells, but also reflect the enlightening suggestions of the higher order discarnate intelligences that are engaged in the process. So when I close the circuit, not only I start receiving influx that can heal my worn out physical cells, but I start receiving uh, 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 influence, good influence from the discarnate intelligences that are supporting the process. What are these discarnate intelligences doing there? They are protecting the circuit. They are protecting the circuit so, so there's no break. So they come around. When we do this, when we put the finger in there, per se, they'll come around and stay around, like a firewall, if you will, so the circuit stays in place. They will protect us by sustaining our connection until I finish my prayer and I say, thank you very much, and so and so, that's it. Then I take my finger off. But again, I am the only one initiating this. God does not pray for me. I ask for it. Okay, so now we know what happens at the conceptual level, but he just said something. I receive influx that will heal my cells. How can I be? Cells are cells, they're material level. How can I be? So there's gotta be a connection from uh, the spiritual realm and each one of my 70 trillion cells. Yes, there is one, okay? And here's the connection. When we look at the cell, this is just a sketch, a drawing, uh, academically, we divide the cell in two parts. The center, the yellow part, is called the nucleus, and everything else is called the cytoplasm. Each cell is almost like a, a, an individual. It has a breathing, it has a digestion, excretion, different things. In order for that to happen, it has several organs to, to take uh, care of that. These organs, which are these little things here, they're called, they're called organelles because they're tiny, tiny. So the cell is divided in nucleus and cytoplasm. The cytoplasm has a, a bunch of uh, these organelles. One of them matters a lot. It's this little guy here. Okay, it's called mitochondrion. What is this mitochondrion doing there? This is responsible for metabolism in the cell. This takes oxygen and glucose and converts into energy. And that's how the cell lives. That's how the cell lives. Now, this guy does a lot more than that. You see, it would be very easy if this guy here, the mitochondrion, would just receive glucose, receive oxygen, produces energy, and that's it. That would be a very automated process, and it would work, yes, it would work, but that's not what it is. Andrea Luis explains to us there's something else. This is what it says, through the mitochondrion, which could be considered accumulation of spiritual energy, so let's stop here a minute. I am a scientist. I'm at the microscope. I look at the mitochondria. Do I see spiritual energy? I don't. So some of the results might be a little strange to me because I'm not seeing the whole thing. My equipment is not equipped to show me everything. So there are some results that I see in my microscope and I don't, kind of don't understand, okay? Here's part of it. So these accumulation of spiritual energies in forms of granules, these are little granules. I don't know if you can see them here, little dots and little balls. Those are the granules. 
ensuring cellular activity, meaning without them there is no cellular activity. They're necessary, okay? So through the mitochondria, the mind transmits to the physical vehicle where it fits, meaning the body. The mind transmits to the body during the incarnation all of its unhappy and happy states and everything in between. Therefore, balancing or disturbing all these cycles. So here's full happiness, here's full unhappiness, and everything in between. What he's saying here is, here's a mitochondrion. Each, of the, uh, each cell has several mitochondriums. Uh, the, the parts of the body, the liver and uh, the lungs, where metabolism is more intense, those cells have a thousand mitochondrium, each cell. Okay, other cells in the body don't have as many. But each one of these guys, what they do now, what ex he explains is they got glucose, they got oxygen. Before they convert the energy, they'll ask, what is my state of mind? They ask the question, every, every single woman, every single mitochondrion in every single cell, what is my state of mind? And the answer is, uh, I want to kill somebody today. Could be. I'm really, you know, I had a fight with my boss. I'm really in a bad mood. So here's the answer. I want to kill somebody today. The energy that's going to be produced right there is compatible with that answer. So if the answer is, I want to kill somebody today, the energy generated is the energy that's going to kill somebody today. Or, oh, I'm great today. I did a lot of charity work this morning. Okay, the energy that's going to be generated is going to be compatible with great charity. Now, where is that energy staying in my body? So uh, I had a fight with my boss, and I'm really mad at him, and I want to, you know, just punch him tomorrow, and I'm, like, suffering. Each one of these cells is generating energy that is compatible with revenge or hatred, whatever it is. The energy is in my body, not his. It's in my body. I am the only one paying for that. I am the only one suffering because of that, not him, not his body. So now it becomes more complicated because my state of mind matters. My state of mind will generate a certain kind of energy as a result of the metabolism, and he continues. Humans can, by their own unhappy or happy behavior and anything in between, boost or fade the coloration of the programs that will determine their route. Meaning, when I get into a certain state of mind, that's going to determine my route. This is what it's going to be for me. It's going to be very difficult because I'm, on, I'm always in revenge mode. I'm always in hatred. Or it's going to be very nice because I'm always good. I'm always do, doing good things. And here's what it says then. That will determine the route through the units of psychomatic force on the cytoplasm. So you see this, this, the units of psychomatic force are in the cytoplasm. So there is part of the cytoplasm that talks spiritual language. We're going to see what it is. So part of the cytoplasm is material only. It's just plain material, but part of it talks spiritual language and transfers the information between the two worlds. Okay? So how is that transferred? If you look at the cell here, you see these little blue guys here? Okay? Let's bring them closer to us. These are called centrioles. This is formed, if, if you look at one of these here, you see the little tubes, okay? They are sets of three tubes. There's three tubes here, then three here, then three here, then three here. It's a collection of threes, and it makes all around nine collections. And there are two of these like that, just like when you see in the picture, okay? What is this doing there? It took science a very long time to find out. It's still debatable within <coughs> science. The answer started changing in 2001 when one of the very well-known scientists here in the U.S. It's a scientist, meaning there is no God, there's no religion, there's no soul. A plain, regular uh, uh, scientist, okay? And he's called uh, Jeffrey Setnova. And when he was a kid, he was always, he always had interest in see how the body works. So he went to medical school. The first time he goes to a microscope to see a cell, 
he notices that the cell is there. It's hard to see on a microscope because there's a lot of moving things, but he would see something in there. And then suddenly he would see two, they, he calls tubes. He would see tubes, two tubes coming up like if they were going out of the cell. And the cell would duplicate with the tubes. So you have a cell here in the tubes. Then it duplicates exactly the same. And the tubes go down on both. And then here's another cell. Nothing is happening. Then the tubes go up. It duplicates exactly. Both tubes on both cells go down. And he said, there's something there that we're missing. And he goes after you know, the, the answer. He studies that a lot. And he comes with the answer. He comes with the answer. The, and this is a scientist in the United States, 2001. The answer is they go up to receive spiritual information. And they go down when they close the circuit. They open the circuit. Connection establishes, closes the circuit. I mean, when you look at this that he's saying, and you cross against what Andrew Louise has been telling us since 1940, it's beautiful because now we know why. So these guys, what are they doing there? They are providing the connection. They are the channel through which the mitochondria is going to ask, what's your state of mind? Remember the mitochondria. Glucose, oxygen, hold on. Before I do anything else, what's your state of mind? How, do, how is that question posed? Through these little guys here. They go up, the question is posed, the answer comes down, they shut down. It, it, it's a process. It's, it's complicated in a way, but we can, you know, using these images, probably understand what it is. And he goes even further, Andre Luis. He says, the chromosomes are structured as infinitesimal granules of physio-psychosomatic nature, physio. Physiology, physical level, psycho, mental, somatic, expresses the mental on the physical. So it's the chromosomes is the same thing. They have one leg in the physical realm and another leg in the spiritual level. That's very interesting because when you go to a scientist, they'll, if you ask him, what is a chromosome? He's going to say, well, it's a, it's a chain of proteins. But look at the definition that Andre Luis gives us. He doesn't say anything about proteins. He says special fluidic magnetic concentrates. Yes, you want to say something? Yes, I would like to ask. Um, it's something that I'm very, I don't know, expert in it, but how do you measure this? Mm. No, no, it's observation. You see on the microscope when they go up. So, yes, but then he, he did the allegation, the confirmation that it's a spiritual thing. Because every time they go up, there's a change in the cell that you cannot explain through material, at the material level. For example, cell duplication. We don't have an explanation for cell duplication out of the blue. It just duplicates. But then when you look at it, they go up, there's information being transmitted, it duplicates and it goes down. It goes down here, goes down here. So every time there's a change in the cell, these things go up. Okay, it's, it's not a measure in terms of a number, certain number of bytes per minute. It's not like this, okay? So you see, the, uh, what he's saying here is that the chromosomes have one leg in the physical body, and that is in the nucleus of the cell, but they have another leg in the spiritual, which is in the cytoplasm through the same centrioles. So genetics, genetics also goes through the channel to ask. And that's how we are finding from the people who study epigenetics, which is you know, one, one line above genetics, why and how we can change our genes. Because you would say, well, how can I change my genes? Well, I can certify that they were this way here Later on, they are that way. Okay, I see they're different, but how did it happen? How did it happen? It happens here. It happens here because the chromosomes has one leg in physical, one leg in spiritual, and they connect. They connect through these centrioles. This is very powerful, and this is information from 1940, 1950. It's been around. We just didn't know what to do with that until probably 2001 when the scientist Jeffrey Satnova he wrote a book, it's called The Quantum Brain. It's very interesting. So here's, here's some, uh, let's get into prayer now that we know what happens, okay? How can I use prayer for myself? So 
Andrea Luis tells us this, prayer is the loftiest touch of induction for putting ourselves in immediate, immediate, because when I open the circuit, it's right away. Okay, when I put my fingers in the outlet, it's right away. Immediate, communion with the higher realms. So I open the circuit, I open the circuit. The prayer-focused mind may be compared to a starry flower open before the infinite in order to absorb its life-giving dew of life and light, meaning once I establish the circuit, I open up to receive good stuff, the good stuff. And the good stuff is going to come through those centrioles, those little guys, and they're going to go into every single cell of my body. Okay, and that's how prayer starts to heal, one cell at a time, one, actually, one mitochondria at a time. A lie to the cleanliness of the spirit, meaning if the spirit is not clean, morally clean, that doesn't apply. So you have to make the effort to get morally better. Prayer represents a commutator of mental currents, meaning my thought goes this way, but I've been praying and I'm trying to get better, it starts to change that way. That's the change we want to see in all of us. That's moral refinement. So it represents a commutator of mental currents, propelling them towards sublimation. And again, how does it happen? When I go and I put my finger in the outlet. If I don't do this, nothing changes. And it can only change when I put my fingers in the outlet. And here's a, more of Andrew Luis. The divine rays emitted by sanctifying prayer, I stop right there. I'm gonna pray to God, okay? Who prays? I pray to God or God prays to me? I pray. I pray. I'm the one praying. I'm the one closing the circuit, right? So I'm praying. Divine rays emitted by this prayer. So this prayer contains divine rays. So when I close the circuit, I'm able to put out divine stuff that is already in me. It was already in me. It wasn't created outside. This is what he's saying here. He was already in me. Right? Now, Jesus says, we are gods. That's this. Okay, so the sanctifying prayer, the, the rays emitted are converted into high-level factors of effective and definite cooperation in the healing of the body, the renewal of the soul, and the enlightenment of the conscience. Three levels. So when I close the circuit, I go to the physical level to heal my worn-out cells. I go to my soul level for renewal, and I go to my conscience level to retain that. Three levels. All elevated prayer is a source of creative and vivifying magnetism. And anybody, anybody who cultivates prayer with the proper balance of sentiment gradually becomes a radiating lo a focal point of divine energies. Balance of sentiment, gradually. Gradually means I pray now, I pray later today, I pray tomorrow, I pray the next day. Gradually, what happens? I start, I become a radiating point of divine energies. You are gods. I have the divine energy in, and I put it out. You see, it's very powerful, very powerful. Living currents flow from within each intelligence and are projected onto its ener energy halo, structuring its aura. So all these rays that I put out, all these currents flowing out of me, that composes what we call the aura, or the psychic photosphere of each one of us. That aura contains my thoughts, contains my moral states. It shows my moral states. The aura can be seen by other spirits. Discarnate spirits can see our aura. And that aura carries my state of mind. If I'm in the revenge mode, they will see revenge. They will, those who are in the revenge mode as well, they'll approach me. They'll come around. Okay? Prayer is the basic means of inner renewal. Basic means, right? By which divine understanding, divine understanding descends from the soul of life to the life of the soul. So when I close the circuit, I bring energy from the soul of life into the life of the soul. So 
very powerful. But I have to close the circuit, and I have to concentrate on that. All right, some final thoughts before we wrap up. Number one, pr uh, and I put it this way, prayer helps build a new reality. Well, what is reality? Think about this. Reality has two, uh, it, it's like a twofold thing. First, reality is us here right now talking. That's reality. Now, let's say, for example, that uh, I had a bad day today. I had a fight with my boss, and I'm really mad, really mad. And I go home, and I put in my mind this idea that I'm just going to hit this guy tomorrow because I can't take it anymore. So I go home. Here I'm going home, and that's in my mind all the time. Tum, tum, tum. And I go home, and I'm not watching TV. I'm not paying attention to anything. I just have that thought, that recurring thought in my mind. Then I start, I start imagining how I'm going to do this. I'm going to wait for him. When he comes through that door, I'm going to go this, and I'm going to punch him this way, and he's going to fall down. You see, I'm playing a whole story. That's my storyboard. For my brain, it already happened. The brain cannot, cannot tell the difference between reality, memory, and imagination. Cannot. It's all the same. For the brain, brain is physical. Brain is a, a set of cells, right? A collection of cells. The three things are the same. So when I do all this theater and this playing in my mind, for me, it's already reality. And if I, even if I never really do this at the physical level, if I never really go to my boss and hit him and all of that, I did. My brain thinks it was done. So when I say prayer helps build a new reality, is that reality? It's not that something that I did really physically is going to be undone. No. It's something that is in my mind, the fact that I hit my boss with prayer. When I close the circuit, that's going to be cleaned out. So there's going to be a point where this is not really living in my mind anymore. That's what it means. It creates a new reality. The importance of collective prayer. Well, we, we see this here. Right? Sometimes uh, in a center we do collective prayer. And it's just beautiful. You, you, you feel, the, especially on bigger events, if we have uh, conferences and stuff like that, when there's collective prayer, we feel things transforming. We feel the, the environment lighter, different. It gets transformed. Uh, there's a very interesting story here uh, in the city of Council Bluffs here in the state of Iowa. In 1998, it's a small city. It's like a 60, 70,000 uh, population of 60,000, 70,000. And that was in 1998, so many years ago. It was a relatively small city, but the crime rate started to climb for apparent no reason. The police couldn't really pinpoint it's because of this, it's because of that. It was just going up in a small city. And they go like, well, uh, we can't find what it is. It, not really bad crimes, but a lot of small crimes here and there. But the number of uh, uh, police bulletins that had to be issued was just growing up. Okay. So one guy from this city goes to a conference in India where they called in 70 gurus from 70 different religions to get together and see if they could do something other than just you know, be in a meeting, if they could do some change, if they could provide some change to the world. In the meeting, this guy from that city, Council Bluffs in Iowa, he said, well, we can't try on my city. We're having a strange problem. This is the problem. The crime rate goes up. So what they do is, yes, we're going to go, all 70 of us, one from each religion, all different belief systems, we're going to go to your city. We're going to stay there for two weeks, praying every single day, 24 hours, so they take turns. Because it's 70 people, it's easy to take turns. 24 hours, two weeks, and we're going to see what happens. So they go to the city. Nobody knows. Police doesn't know, mayor doesn't know, nobody knows, population doesn't know. And then they start on a Friday. By Sunday night, there's almost no crime, which for police was, oh, great, that's great, with no explanation, though. But it was great. So they go another week, and another week, and the crime rate goes almost to zero. They leave. When they leave, the crime rate starts all the way back up to the, to the levels that it was before. 
so th that shows us how collective prayer changes the environment, changes the atmosphere. We see this in big events at times. And, and us here too, okay, in the Spiritist Center. Healing as well as diseases are processes, not punctual events. You don't get, for example, uh, people don't get cancer overnight. It's been there. It wasn't detectable to a certain day where that level now is detectable because of the equipment that we have. But it was there and it was not punctual. It wasn't like one minute before I didn't have it, now I do. No, it's a process. Now, creating diseases is also, always a process. And getting out of them is always a process. And then we get something very interesting to think about. These are thoughts. Let's say, for example, that because of the moral standards that I have throughout a million lives, uh, I took my body to the level that it produced cancer because of my bad behavior, moral standard, spiritual history. Now, that cancer is because I behave badly and I got this. Now, one day, I'm going to be a lot more a lot better than what I am morally, more advanced, and I don't need to have that cancer anymore, so I'm going to get out of it. It doesn't mean in this life. It could be a three, four, six, ten lives ahead of this one. To get out of it, you see, it's the same thing. When I have my moral refinement finished, I'm going to get cancer because that's how I got in and that's how I got out. What puts me in is what puts me out. So sometimes we do a lot of judgment. Oh, this guy has that. Yeah, you, you got that because you did this. Not necessarily. He might be suffering that because he's getting out of it. And most of us will say, oh, well, yeah, bad person. Never do this. Don't. Never. It could be exactly the other way around. He could be getting out of it. Okay? And most people wait to be healed before they say a prayer. But to be healed, you better say a prayer, right? So most people say, well, when I get out of the hospital, I'm going to do this and this and this. I'm going to thank this. And I'm going to thank that. And I'm going to do a lot of prayer. No, the prayer comes before you heal, before you get better. Because that's when I put my, hand, my fingers in the outlet. And that's when I establish the circuit of forces, the, the energy, that's going to get me out of it. So a lot of people wait for them to get better, to feel better, to do that. But it's exactly the other way around. It's when I do that first, that's going to make me better. I don't know if you have any comments, any questions, but uh, that's the idea we wanted to bring you tonight. Thank you very much. You all have a good night. Thank you. Thank you for taking any questions? <coughs> any comments? Okay. I think it's <laughs>